about prayer. Talked a lot about fasting, and uh, we're going to finish out here tonight talking about prayer. Daniel chapter 9, and let's begin reading in verse number, verse number 3. Daniel chapter 9, verse number 3. Okay, time out. <laughs> Ito stands up like I'm going to bust him for I'm not busting. Okay, so. Sorry, Brother Peterman. This is about pastor appreciation. Okay. We're doing, we're going to do pastor appreciation this coming Sunday night because I thought he was going to be gone. I didn't realize until he told me today he would be back Sunday night. So, we've already sent out the text message that we were going to plan for next Thursday to do pastor appreciation. We'll just stick with that and he'll think we forgot It'll be fine. We'll make up for it next Thursday night. So pastor appreciation is next Thursday night. We're doing the pound. And uh, we need lots of stuff. You know what pounding is? Uh, Non-perishable food items, laundry detergent, toilet paper, all kinds of anything they can use at home. All right? Bring that. If you want to bring it between now and then, bring it to my house. We'll keep it there. I'll use what I want. And, uh, <laughs> Amen. and then for the kids, we wanted to get a couple of gift cards. You know, give them a gift card to McDonald's or, you know, something like that. Wawa. Brooklyn loves Wawa, and so I'm sure his kids like it too, and they like the milkshakes and stuff like that. So just a little gift card, something like that, to let the kids know we appreciate them, okay? And anybody that's not here, help spread the word around and keep it hush-hush. It is, Miss Kara is all about finding out secrets. It's like a goal of her life. (laughs) And so let's keep that hush-hush. If our kids are in here, we're going to beat them. That's what I was waiting on them to leave, all right? Um, so anyway, we're doing it next Thursday night. We'll get it over here, and at the end of the service, we'll bring it up, and we'll just stack it all up here on the platform. Um, and so that'll be wonderful and great and fabulous. Got any questions? Call me. All right, Daniel chapter 9, now verse number 3. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God, and made my confession, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned. He says, we have sinned. He included himself in that. We'll talk about that a little bit tonight. We have sinned, and have committed iniquity, and have done wickedly, and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts, And from thy judgments, neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets which spake in thy name, to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day, to the men of Judah, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and and unto all Israel, that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespasses that they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. We'll stop reading right there. We're going to cover a lot more of this tonight. Uh, But we're not going to preach long. Uh, But prayer. You know, everybody. the, the disciples went to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us what? To pray. They didn't say teach us how to pray. They said teach us to pray. Probably everybody in this room tonight, we've got a method down and we know how to pray. We could go through a prayer list. We've got the methodology down. But probably if we're all honest, the biggest struggle we have is just simply to pray. Not that we don't know how. Tonight, we need this, we, we, and the preacher's been burdened about it, and we've talked about it, and he's preached on it several weeks, and we want to have this prayer meeting, and so we're not going to preach long because we want to have prayer time, but man, we've got, to, we've got to get to a place in our lives where prayer is important. Sleeping in is not important. It's hard to get up. I'm sure carrying the cross was hard. You say, oh, come on, that doesn't count. Why not? Why, why doesn't it count? I mean, that's what he did for us, and I can't get up 10 or 15 minutes early to spend some time praying and reading my Bible. Uh, it's important, and that's for all of us, all right? I'm not trying to uh, bust anybody out tonight. Uh, I'm just saying, uh, really, that's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a struggle to get up and pray, and prayer is what we need. The de- I've heard it said this, the devil fears most a praying Christian. 
The devil doesn't really worry about you reading your Bible because power comes from prayer. You can read your Bible and be completely out on God. But if you're really genuinely praying, you're getting a hold of God, you will be close to him. You will be close. And that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to do. That's where he wants us to be. And that's what the devil wants to stop us from. So let's cover it tonight. We'll, uh, we'll pray. We'll have another quick song. And then we'll get right into this. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us tonight. Uh, Lord, prayer. We need it. And God, uh, as, we, as we talk about what Daniel did and how he prayed and some of the things that he prayed for, uh, God, I pray that you'd help us to take those things to heart and to mind and, and apply them to our lives. God, there's probably not a Christian here, probably plenty of Christians that do pray, but probably not one Christian here that couldn't go to another level in their prayer life, that couldn't maybe do something different or change it, make it more meaningful, make it more real. And so, God, I pray that you'd challenge us tonight, and then as we spend some time praying, I pray that it would not be just a a casual time of let's get this over with and just get through it. But, God, I pray we'd get a hold of you. Lord, our country is in a mess, and the only thing that will bring it back is praying to the God of heaven, your people getting a hold of you. And so I pray that you'd help us to be able to do that tonight. Bless us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes when life seems gentle and blessings flood my way, I turn my gaze away from you and soon forget to pray. But when the sky grows darker and courage turns to fear, my anxious voice cries upward with words you long to hear. Lord, I need you when the sea of life is calm. Oh, Lord, I need you when the wind is blowing strong. Whether trials come or cease, keep me always on my knees. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, help me to remember I'm weak, but you are strong. I cannot sing apart from you, for, Lord, you are my song. Although I'm prone to wander and boast in all I do, Lord, keep my eyes turned upward so I depend on you. Lord, I need you. When the sea of life is calm, oh Lord, I need you. When the wind is blowing strong, whether trials come or cease, keep me always on my knees. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Whether trials come or cease, keep me always on my knees. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Amen. We definitely need him. Preacher began this message last week, and he gave me his outline. Wanted me to just kind of finish up here this evening. And so, last week he talked about fasting, 
and uh, things that fasting does, and we talked about the six things that fasting does. It strengthens our prayer life. Um, it puts self down. It will stay the judgment of God. It stops the enemies of God. Uh, a bunch of things that fasting does. Sometimes I preached a message in Bible college. Uh, when I was in college, we had every day in one of our classes, we had five minutes to preach. And uh, I preached one time, uh, bug God. Bug God. God and the the importune lady there that went to the king every day and and said I've got a problem I need you to do something about it and and he wouldn't do it and he wouldn't do it and he wouldn't do it and finally he said I'm going to give her what she wants lest by her continual coming she weary me and uh, now I'm not saying that was uh, my my idea of bugging God was theologically correct uh, but the principle is there. I don't believe God gets bugged and irritated when we come to Him, but sometimes I believe God withholds the answer because He wants to know how badly we want what we say we want. God, I want you to save my lost loved ones. God, I want you to save America. I want you to bring America back to you. God, I want to know your will for my life. But we only mention it one, one or two times, just kind of nonchalantly off the cuff when we're praying. God says, why would I answer that prayer? It's not really important to you. You think about your life. You parents think about your kids. The things that are important to your children, they, they bug you about them, right? I mean, they continually come to you, come to you, come to you. I want this, I want this, I want this, I need this, I need this, I need this. I, fine! Sometimes we may even give in uh, to something that's not necessarily good for them just so they'll leave us alone. Again, I don't believe God does that. But I do believe God wants us to come. The principles all through the Bible, ask, ask. Knock, seek, ask, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened. Seek, and ye shall find. Uh, ask, and it shall be given, is what it says. God wants us to come to Him. And so prayer is, is probably the most profitable tool that God has given us as Christians. Yet it's probably the least used tool in our Christian life. Uh, if you've been saved for any length of time, you've all had a prayer list. We've all had a prayer list in a time in our life where we're just running down through those things. I've done it. You've probably done it. Uh, we get in the, the habit. That's, that's that vain jangling. That's that vain repetition that the Bible talks about in the New Testament. We're just going over it. I'm just reading my prayer list. There's a big difference between reading through my prayer list and getting a hold of God, getting into the throne room, getting into God's presence. And so prayer is something that ought to be practiced by every Christian, but probably is not. John R. Rice said this, every failure is a prayer failure. Think about that. Every failure in my life is a prayer failure. If I'm struggling with some temptation, I can't seem to get victory over something, I'm probably not praying about it like I should. Genuine prayer, real prayer. Uh, if there's a need that's not being met in my life, it's not because I don't have the God who can answer. I'm probably just not asking. What do you say in, in, in the book of James? Ye have not because ye... Ask not. And so prayer is something that's vital to the Christian life, yet many do not do it, or we're just in a, uh, a routine, uh, and it doesn't really mean anything. And so I want to talk just about uh, a few things here tonight. preacher said, uh, he talked about fasting last week. This one, we want to pray. Number one, we want to pray with steadfast confidence. Steadfast confidence. Now, the preacher was talking last, be, last week a little bit about our country. And obviously, anybody that pays any attention at all, we know America's in a mess. We know America is in trouble. Uh, and I don't know if America will ever come back to God. I'm not one of those that, that says I don't believe revival can happen. Um, but sometimes I wonder. Okay, I'm just saying, I know we're in a mess. Uh, but we need to pray when we pray with steadfast confidence. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and verse number 4. Verse number 4, Daniel says, I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Daniel's about to start confessing some sins, but right there he's talking, about, he's talking to God, but he's talking about who God is from a knowledge that he knows. He knows God is the great and terrible God. He knows God is one that keeps His word and keeps the covenant with those that keep His commandments. Daniel knows that by experience. And so he's got a confidence when he prays that I'm praying to the God. I'm praying to the one that hears and the one that answers. Sometimes I think we pray and do we really believe we're talking to God? 
I mean, do we really think, do we have the confidence that God can do what we're asking him to do? I mean, you think, I don't know what you're praying about tonight, but you think about your, uh, the things that you need God to do, the things that maybe tonight you're asking God specifically for. When you pray, do you pray confidently, understanding and knowing that God is able to do this? God is capable. You see, God is able and capable whether you believe it or not, but the, the Bible also talks about if you don't believe it, you're not going to get the answers to your prayers. You have to pray believing David was, or Daniel was confident, and then he was steadfast in his praying. Let's look at some verses. Look at verse number 7. O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faith. You see, David, or da, I keep saying David, Daniel knows his place. He knows where he's at. Daniel, I don't believe Daniel is out on God. I don't believe Daniel is backslid, but he includes himself in this group. He's saying, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. You think about America tonight. There's a lot of Christians running around. There's a lot of pastors and preachers and evangelists running around saying you need to, uh, they're talking about who to vote for. And I'm not going there tonight. Uh, but if you vote for Trump or Hillary, uh, then you're not right with God as a Christian. You need to vote third party and blah, 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 blah. And who you vote for at this point doesn't matter to me. Yeah, amen, I vote for Jesus. I'm going to write him in. I'm just saying, uh, we've got to be careful. Some of these, these people are running around with this high and mighty attitude. Well, if America goes to hell because all you other Christians didn't do right. No, 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 if America goes to hell, because, it'll be because we, you, and me. The reason America's in the mess that America's in is because Christians like us have not done what God's called us to do for the past several decades. You say, well, I just got saved. I understand that. But we're all Americans tonight, and I believe everybody in this room is a Christian tonight. That makes us part of the group as a whole. America as a whole kicked God out. I'm an American, so I'm part of that group. Does it make sense? Don't be one of these, uh, these pious Christians that think, well, uh, it's because everybody else, and I don't think anybody is, just saying we've got to be careful of that. That's a mentality the devil could get in and corrupt our minds with, corrupt our thinking with, and we think, well, it's, it's all those other Christians' faults. No. Daniel said, it's, it's us. It's me. It's not my brother or my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Verse number 7, he says, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day. Uh, look down at verse number 9. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgivenesses, though we have rebelled against him. Again, Daniel didn't do anything to rebel against God, but he's including himself in a group as his, in his confession. He's saying, God, we have done wrong. We have done wrong. Look at verse number 14. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil is, a, is come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. Listen, all of these, he's talking about the, the might of God, the power of God, the goodness of God. He says, we've sinned, but God, you're full of forgiveness, you're full of mercy, you keep your promises, you keep your covenants to them that keep your commandments. His focus is on God. Verse number 20 and 21. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing, look at it, my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. What's happening here? Daniel's got his prayer in order. He's, he's praying confidently to the only God there is, and he's steadfast in the fact that, God, you're right. You, you study it out. Look at what he's saying there. God, you're right. We're wrong. He's steadfast in it. He's sure in it. He's not praying in confusion. Too many times I think a lot of us do that. We pray confused prayers. We confuse ourselves. We might even confuse the Lord. He's steadfast. Steadfast means fixed in one direction, firm, unwavering. Daniel's not all over the map. Daniel understands if we're going to get right to God, with God, if we're going to get back to God, it starts with confession. And it took him the first 20 verses of Daniel chapter 9 to confess sin. His sin 
and the sin of his nation. How often, how, how much time do I spend confessing sin? God, I can't remember everything I did wrong yesterday. I pray that you just forgive me for everything, cleanse me. You, you know, that might work once in a while. But Brother Weedo says this, you sin them one at a time, you ought to confess them and get them right one at a time. Keep short sin accounts. Keep short sin. Don't wait until the end of the day and then go back and confess all your sins. You'll forget them. When you do wrong, get it right right away. As soon as God convicts you about it, get it right. But he was steadfast. He was unwavering in his direction. He knew what he wanted from God. But before he could get to that point, he had to make sure he was getting right with God. We're to pray with steadfast confidence. Basically, it means this. Glance at your problems, but gaze at God. Daniel knew what the problem was. He knew what the sins were, but he wasn't dwelling on the sins. He confessed them, but he was dwelling on who God was. God, you're merciful. God, you've promised that you'd forgive. You're full of forgivenesses. He said there in verse number 9, God, you're full of mercy. You're full of grace. You're full of... His gaze was on God. He knew what his problem was, and he glanced at it. God, here's what we've done. And God, I'm going to confess them, but God, I'm going to throw throw myself at your mercy. God, you are so wonderful. You are so big. You are so mighty. And we need to pray with confident steadfastness about God, to God. Listen, my prayer is not about me. How much of your prayer life is about you? I was talking to a preacher this week, and uh, he was talking to Pastor Doug Fisher. And uh, Brother Fisher's church out there in San Diego, they have 12 prayer meetings a week at their church. Ladies' prayer meetings, teen prayer meetings, uh, men's prayer meetings, bus workers' prayer meetings. They've got all these different prayer meetings. It's a big ministry. They've got a lot going on. But he said the biggest prayer meeting they have is on Saturday night. That's the one that most people attend. And it's a praise prayer meeting. He said we don't ask for anything. He said the other 11 prayer meetings that go on at our place through the week, we're asking God to do something. He said but on Saturday night... We don't ask for anything. We just praise and we worship and we thank God. And he said that's the longest prayer meeting we have. Sometimes it'll go three hours. Three hours. Some of you probably just swallowed real hard going, three hour prayer meeting. I don't think I could handle that. We've got to start somewhere. We've got to start somewhere praising God. You see, it was all, that prayer meeting for them is all about God. Praying with steadfast confidence. I am not concerned today. I am not worried that when I pray, I'm praying to a fake God. Does that make sense? I know who I'm praying to. I'm praying to the God of heaven, Jesus Christ, Jehovah. That's who I'm praying to. Amen? I was texting with somebody earlier this week, and they were struggling with some things, and, and they texted me today and said, it's amazing how God shows up, knows exactly what you need, and just shows up right when you need it, right when you think it's all about to come caving in on you, God shows up and does something. You know why? Because we're praying to the real God. Amen. You need to pray with steadfast confidence. Number two, we need to pray with sincere confession. Sincere confession. The word sincere means earnest, genuine and real. Earnest, genuine, and real. We'll not take the verse or the time to go back through all of these verses, uh, but you read Daniel chapter 9 again, and he's very genuine in confessing their sins. He's naming them specifically, but this is not just a generic, we blew it, please forgive us. No, he's getting specific, and he's getting real with God. And he said in verse number 20, When I confessed my sins. You see, in order to confess, confess means to make known. In order to confess your sins, you have to confess what you know. And if you just wait till the end of the day or wait until the next morning to blanket prayer your sins, that's not confession. Confession is saying, this is what I did wrong. I acknowledge it. I understand it. I agree with you, God, that I did this. This was wrong. That's what confession is. That's what they ask these, these guys, uh, uh, murderers and all that. Do you want to do you want to make a confession? No. Why? Because they don't want to get in trouble. They're going to try to play the system. Uh, too many Christians trying to play the system with God. And God doesn't play that way. 
confess them. Get real with God. He already knows what I've done anyway. Why would I try to hide? The Bible says in Proverbs, Whoso hideth and covereth his sins is not wise. The opposite of being wise is fool in the Bible. I'm a fool if I try to hide it from God. He already knows. Get real with God. Romans chapter 3, verse 23 um, says, and I always get that one mixed up with 10. What's it say? Is that one it? Are you sure? I can't find Romans. 3.10, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. 3.23. Okay, whatever, I'll trust you. Confessing. We are, we are wrong. You can't get saved without confessing your sins to God. Now, that's not every sin of your life. That's agreeing with God, I am a sinner. I have, my whole life is wrapped up in sin. But once I get saved, 1 John 1, 1.9 says, you need to confess them. Confess your sins, and he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins, the ones you confessed. If you're not willing to get real with God and admit where you're wrong, he's not, he's not going to forgive you of that. You've got to confess it. And Daniel was real with God. He was sincere with God. James chapter 5. Take your Bible and go over there. We'll come back to Daniel in a minute. James chapter 5. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. I knew I knew it. That was the other one that was bothering me. James chapter 5, verse number 16. First word, confess your faults one to another, and then pray one for another that ye may be healed. Then the rest of the verse says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know what effectual, fervent prayer is? Sincere prayer. It's real. It's genuine. It is earnest. It is hard work. It is not praying through a pattern. It is not praying through a list. It is getting down and getting a hold of God. 1 Peter 4, 17, the first part of the verse says this, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. I said this a minute ago, and we've heard it our whole Christian life. If America's going to get back to God, it starts right here. It doesn't start in Washington. Doesn't start with politicians. Doesn't start with voters. It starts with God's people. And until we get right, and that is teenagers to the oldest adult in here, until we get right, God is not obligated to move in our midst, let alone in our nation. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then will God answer. Then will God heal the land. The principle is there for us, I believe it. That was written to the Jews, but the principle is the same with God. If God's people will get their hearts right, God can, and he says in that verse, will heal their land. But if we're not willing to get right, if we're not willing to pray sincerely and get, get real with God about what we are and what we've done, listen, my sins are just as bad as anybody else's sins. I may not have kicked God out of the public school in the 1950s, but I'm not the Christian I ought to be. Let's just be honest tonight with each other and with God. I may, not, I may not believe in abortion, and I may not believe in homosexuality, and I may not believe in, in all this other stuff that's going on in our country, but do I not walk with God every day like I'm supposed to? How many of you didn't read your Bible today? How many of you didn't pray today? Hey, it starts there, folks. It starts with the basics, walking with God. And so I cannot say, I'll say it again, I cannot say it's every other Christian, it's the past Christian generations who got us into this mess. No, I'm part of the mess. And until I'm willing to admit it, and until I'm willing to agree with God that my sins have helped get us here, it's not being real with God. Sincere confession. And then lastly, we need to pray with spiritual concern. Pray with spiritual concern. When Daniel prayed, he was not just trying to get out of trouble. Who's ever done that? Sure. My testimony. When I was 12 years old, I cheated in school. My dad threatened to kill me, but we were having revival that night. He goes, I'm going to take care of this when we get home. He had to go to the church to take care of stuff. And I kid you not, 
my thinking, my thought pattern was, if I get saved, it might save me from a beating. And it worked. Except I didn't get saved. I didn't get whooped. But I didn't get saved. You see, I was not praying for spiritual concern. I was praying to get out of difficulty. I was praying to get out of trouble. I was using God to bail me out. The rest of the time I didn't need Him. How many Christians have ever prayed that way? Sure I have. Sure I have. When things are going good, I don't really need the Lord. So I think. I need God all the time. But too many Christians wait until the storms show up in their life and then they want to go run into God. Just like the disciples in the storm started throwing stuff out of the boat, trying to figure it out themselves, and then finally go to God. God, save us. Don't you care about us? You're down there sleeping in the bottom of the boat. We've thrown out everything we need. God goes, oh, you have little faith. You know what that means in 21st century English? Dummy. So I can calm the storm. We still got nothing to sail the ship with because you threw it overboard. Now it's Jesus, and he got him back to safe uh, to land. I'm just saying, that's that, that mindset, and we still have it today. We need to pray with spiritual concern. Daniel wasn't worried about getting out of trouble. In fact, I think if you study the timeline, Daniel was dead long before God ever bailed them out of captivity. And really, from, from Babylon, Babylon on, they were kind of in captivity and they're still being messed with. Everybody still hates the Jews. He wasn't praying to get out of difficulty. It was a spiritual concern. Daniel wanted to be right with God. Daniel was praying for the glory of God. He was praying with a spiritual mind. And so let me ask you tonight, and we're, we're done, and we're going to spend some time praying. When you pray, are you praying with God's goal in mind, or are you praying with your goal in mind? What is your goal? It could be as simple as, I need to get through my prayer list so I can say I prayed today, or I need God to fill these requests on my prayer list, or are we praying to get a hold, like they did in the Old Testament, get a hold of the horns of the altar? Remember when Joab was killed? You know where they found him? In the temple, hanging onto the horns of the altar. He's trying to get a hold of God. Now it was a little too late for him. And he was doing what we're talking about not doing. He was praying to get out of trouble. But that's what we need. We need some Christians to get a hold of the horns of the altar. Not, to get, not for God to necessarily bail us out. But for God's will to be done. For God's glory to be seen. You know, Paul suffered with that thorn in the flesh the rest of his life. Three times he asked God and God said, No, my grace is sufficient. You need that thorn to keep you honest. You need that thorn in the flesh, Paul, so that you understand every day you need me. And then I can get glory from your life. But if I take it away, you forget me. Sometimes I think God leaves me in the storm because that's the only time I talk to him. Just keeping it real. Heads about eyes closed.